and and we're live it yeah. is Ain't wednesday may 13th 2020 five o'clock p.m boris johnson is having trouble guys he uh had what the uh independent called an embarrassing prime minister's questions meanwhile I got the Kim Jong Un news here is is amazing. Fox News is reporting Dennis Rodman describes wild night of hotties and vodka with Kim Jong Un. So we're not allowed to have fun anymore. But apparently Kim Jong Un is, and in lieu of fun, we bring you Tom Wheeler. <laughs> yeah, that's a great um, description. That's the right kind of lead in. Hey, by the way, speaking speaking of Dennis Rodman, have you seen The Last Dance? I have not. The series on ESPN about the Bulls and Michael Jordan. And they spend a whole episode on, um, on uh, Dennis Rodman. And um, I think colorful is a calm way of <laughs> I mean like I feel like Dennis Rodman is like almost like he's not like I like I remember how crazy he was and it was like beyond my comprehension I was also very young but like now it just doesn't seem that bad <laughs> yeah, right. like, no, nothing. That, like that's an, that's an interesting point nowhere. he was highly eccentric and cavorting with Kim Jong-un and how that makes him different from the president of the United States. Exactly how? I would rather the president of the United States wore a wedding dress than. <laughs> no, no the, the, the answer is he's, he plays great defense and the president doesn't play defense very well. His idea about defense is poke, 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 poke. And Rodman's real skill is defense. All right. So before we get into it, I want to say that you almost did not show up. Uh, today because of uh, an offense given by Kate. So I think we should clear yeah. the air here. Yeah. Uh, how did Kate almost uh, uh, cause you to bag on the show? And is there is there anything you want to say to get off your chest about it? Yeah, go Bucks. Um, they, uh, I, um, when we were exchanging some emails about, well, what do you want to talk about? And, um, I should say to the viewers here, Ben and Kate give no guidance on what they want to talk about. Um, I said that- Well, just to be fair, all aspects of the show are planned live on the show. That's actually one of the design features of the show. Okay, okay. Well, I, I, I indicated that my existential concern was whether um, there would be a football season at the Ohio State University giving us yet another chance to once again beat the team up north, um, which we've done, I think, for the last uh, eight straight years, like 14 out of the last. Yeah, it's actually years. like really pitiful. It's like and, um, and Kate took offense at that and said that she had some uh, uh, relationship with uh, the, that school in Ann Arbor that we don't mention the name. And. And Kate, and, and then you threatened not to show up. Yeah, I, I said this, we'll have to re, I didn't threaten not to show. Now, you know, don't go putting words in my mouth then. I just said we might have to reconsider. And yet and I, you're here. I will say in my defense, I am two for two at insulting FCC commissioner or FCC chairman yeah, at this point. That, that's right, because the other day <laughs> Kate the other <laughs> insulted Ajit Pai. Yes. Uh, also uh, in a uh, in an accident. Um, in an accident, and, yes. And uh, <clears throat> this time it's you. So you have finally found the point of common ground with Ajit Pai. <laughs> this could be exactly <laughs> the first time as well. I, it's not the first time that I've brought people together in a weird Venn diagram. <laughs> like, <laughs> anyways, okay. it's so good to have you on the show, Tom. Thanks for coming, Kate. Okay, thank you. And I, you know, I just got to say one thing that I, I see both of you waving your drinks, and um, I haven't poured mine yet, but but there's a story. So, oh my, you have Lafroig. That's like one of my all time favorites. So, Which Lafroig is it? Uh, th this is the Select. Okay, uh, and and the issue is that when I did my first Lawfare podcast, 
I go into you know the floor that Ben owns at uh, at Brookings and into the room that um, that has the studio equipment and everything set up. And sitting there in the middle of the table is a bottle of single malt scotch. Like you know, you're in Mad Men. You know, and so I thought it was symbolic of kind of the entire approach. Uh, it that. is. <laughs> and so I figured, you know, so so um, when you invited me, I was able to overcome my concerns about Kate and her loyalties because it would give me a chance to pour some Lafroig. I First of all, I want to say uh, I, I mean people to take the bottle of scotch on the table in the jungle studio, both seriously and literally. Yeah. Um, well. And, uh, you know, some people only take it seriously. Some people take it very literally. Um, I think uh, uh, there is a, uh, you know, always an opportunity to, uh, shall we say, lubricate the Lawfare podcast conversation with some scotch, and I, I, uh, and I really appreciate your uh, your your raising that here because I'm sure it is fully in compliance with all Brookings policies. Um, well, you know. So here's my qu my question that I want to start out with, Tom, because I think you know a lot of people think of telecommunications policy as one of these kind of boring Washington subjects that, uh, you know, the kind of New Deal created an agency to regulate and the agency kind of still exists. And, uh, you know, kind of like FERC, right? Like that there's these, there's these agencies that exist because they once had a reason to exist. And um, then there are people who are kind of fanatical about uh, telecommunications policy, which we think of as, uh, you know, which they think of as standing for something else, right? Or, or uh, as really deeply important. And so I guess my first question is, um, in a world in which we can have this show uh, on Zoom streamed to YouTube, none of which is within the jurisdiction of the FCC, except maybe some of the telecommunications and cable lines over which the last end of the traffic is carried. Um, what is the FCC for? And why should we be thinking in the language of telecommunications policy rather than in the language of internet policy? Well, one of the interesting things about the FCC is that it regulates one sixth of the American economy, all of the networks. Uh, as you point out, uh, you know, the, the uh, internet ISPs, the telephone networks, the satellite networks, the broadcast networks, and it's one sixth of the GDP of the country. But the really interesting thing is that the other five sixths requires it. Okay, so what you do with the FCC has an effect on everybody else. And, uh, and that's what makes the job so interesting. And what makes it particularly challenging in these times is as you appropriately point out, the action in terms of, uh, of what's going on, uh, on on the internet is at the edge of the internet, not in the networks itself. And that strongly suggests that we need um, a new approach to how we think about uh, what is the most important network of the 21st century and its, and its services. I mean, you know, the last time, so the, the challenge about being at the FCC is that the, the Communications Act was written in 1934 when radio was the revolutionary technology. And it was last updated in 1996 when the internet was uh, screeching dial-up modems and AOL. I covered that for for the now defunct newspaper Legal Times. The, there you go. The okay. FCC updates in '96. I was there, and not. At the I was FCC. in middle school. 
<laughs> Sorry, I got to throw that, that in every once in a while. You just, like, can't pull rank like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll drink to that. <laughs> no, I remember AOL CDs. I mean, I think that I, and I've said this before, I don't want to cut you off from answering, but I think I, I want to like kind of punctuate Ben's question, which is that I think that I am in an era in which um, I'm kind of a bridge generation in which I grew up and my entire social network developed largely on the internet in person, obviously, but like largely through like chat rooms and AOL instant messenger. And it was a part of my identity from like, you know, very young. Um, and then also I have memories of watching the Iraq war on television and watching like, and like getting our, you know, papers delivered in our driveway. Like, you know, so there was, so there's the kind Which of like- Iraq was, war. Right. Yeah, and, great, great quest. Well, great. No, I was- And I, I was, used to be, and I used to be a newspaper boy. So I used to throw the newspaper. Too. Well, not a boy, but- Person. A, <laughs> a newspaper person. <laughs> uh, newspaper child. Yeah, but like that was, I think that that's, I don't know. I just think that that's an interesting, when you just think of how far the technology has come, like the, like just the hardware. Um, it's just a completely different, um, oh, totally. I just wonder how much has changed. Totally. And, and, and the problem is that we, you know, the government has become proficient at doing again what it did yesterday. <laughs> okay. And, 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 um, and so we get stuck with these agencies that were designed around industrial era assumption, assumptions, but end up getting ambushed by the future. And, um, and so the challenge that policymakers face, and you know, one of the things I keep talking about at Brookings, I just wrote a piece on this uh, at Brookings, is that in a digital environment, we need to start thinking anew about what the role of government is and how it gets carried out. Amen. So, I was okay. Say, let... you, you have a very receptive audience to that theory here. I mean, I was just, I made a joke about you. I don't know, you know the case Pruneyard? Mm -hmm. The Pruneyard case? Yeah. I just made this joke. I was like, remember malls? Remember when malls were the thing that we compared, like the internet, we could like compare the internet to? And that like right. these were like these distinctions. And I don't know. Um, now it's my, wet markets. Yes. To get to, I have a question, which is just, I wrote this, um, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago, but it keeps coming up. And these things always kind of come in waves, but um, about when, uh, after Charlottesville, um, the Daily Stormer was, uh, there was clamoring for the Daily Stormer to come down and Cloudflare, it was like bopping from right. DNS to right. DNS and like right. all of this. Yeah. And Cloudflare, which is to those who don't know, kind of like I would describe it as like one of two or maybe three security kind of uh, like security is the best way to get, I guess, put it. It protects you from, from DDoS attacks. It protects, protects you from like bots swarming your site and taking it ransom and taking it down. Without, um, without just to be clear, without Cloudflare, Lawfare would disappear in an hour. Well, right. And more than that, like Akamai and some other big companies provide these types of services, but they charge for them. Whereas Cloudflare a lot, like covers like the little guy, also right. some really bad guys. Cloudflare is affordable. Other entities are not. And, you know, before we had protection from Cloudflare, Lawfare would just disappear every now and then because- really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, once you achieve a certain level of prominence, there is somebody in the world yeah. who wants to take you down. Yeah. For money. And the costs of doing it are next to nothing. And they can be, you know, a giant yep. state actor yep. or they can be an individual and they can take you down. And so you need, it's a protection racket, but it's a really important, good protection racket. So okay. anyway, sorry, I didn't. So my so my, my point was just that. So Cloudflare does this thing. Cloudflare for years, for those who know the internet and the seedy sides of the internet, has gotten crap for like leaving up places that have like 
like potentially have, or maybe have like child pornography stored on them or like things like that. Like they are, they really don't have taken like a, we are just pipe. We're not going to look type of like mentality towards content. Um, and then the daily stormer came along and there was like this, like, well, Cloudflare, you could be the one to, to really take it down. And Matthew Prince wrote this blog post and did this whole thing. Um, and I wrote this op-ed for the time for the New York times that was just like, this is what we care about when we talk about that last line, that last link of pipe is like transferability or like there being a choke point. And if you can't transfer to another type of like internet service provider, it's the same as not being able to transfer out. doesn't matter how far up in the stack you are. There's the same type of problem. And so I'm just kind of curious if you agree with that, if that's like something that, and I think that we have that problem with the fact that Cloudflare and Akamai are pretty much the only people are the only services that like that provide this oh we can unpeel that all kinds of ways kate i mean um the, the reality is i mean so so the internet experience starts with the ability to get on the internet right and there's a huge problem with that um one problem is that somewhere between uh, six and 12% of Americans could not get on the internet if they wanted to, because they don't have access to high-speed broadband, principally in rural areas. Second problem is that there are um, a, a large number of Americans, again, in the tens of millions that, um, that the internet goes by their door, but they can't bring it into their house because it's too expensive. Um, and the third component um, is that a point you just you just raised, and and that is that um, for about the, the numbers we used to use, uh, and they may have changed, but it was about two thirds of Americans had either zero or one choice of how they got on the internet. So if I don't like the kind of internet service I'm getting, I'm out of luck. I, I, you know, I can't, if I don't like my Ford, I can go buy a Chevy. I haven't got that choice um, on the internet. And what, that was what led us to the whole net neutrality debate and how networks need to be fast, fair, and open, um, which, which, was approached as though it was some kind of revolutionary concept. But the fact of the matter is, you go back to 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed the Pacific Telegraph Act, which included in it a provision that said, because this was essentially a monopoly, you had to provide first come, first serve, non-discriminatory access. And we took that same idea and we put it on the telephone and, um, and then we tried to put that on the um, uh, ISPs and they started arguing, oh no, this is different, this is digital. And we kept saying, it, no, the, the issue isn't how, the issue is what. And, um, and that you need to have uh, the same kind of open access. And, um, and we, we, I was fortunate during my term, we succeeded in, in doing that. It was upheld by the courts. The companies, of course, went to court and challenged it. It was upheld uh, by the courts. And then when the Trump FCC came in, they repealed it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, it has been, uh, yeah, I've but, been, it's been a very interesting couple of years of kind of coming into internet law as like a young scholar and watching like, you know, having learned what you've learned and then like watching it all kind of fall away um, in the, in yeah. the, in the interim. So, so well, I, had a, I, had a, I had a next question for you. Let, me, let I, me build on that just one second. If I yeah, can. sure. Go ahead. The, the, the interesting thing is that, okay, so, so that was the discussion. Kate talked about the internet writ large. That was a response about the network that brings it to you. Now let's talk about the so-called edge providers at the, at the end yes. of the network that are providing the services. And the fascinating thing is that the, you know, the whole concept in the early days of the internet was you know, a thousand flowers will bloom. Uh, will bloom. It will be you know, an, an uncurated, unfiltered, oh my goodness, 
and and um and 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 the decentralized network because that's how a digital network is set up on a distributed basis will lead to all kinds of distributed sources instead what it led to was a new centralization a virtual centralization of economic and market power and so you've got both of these issues controlling the internet today you've got you got monopoly networks or dominant networks and monopoly services or dominant services and you're trying to deal with them with structures that were designed in the late 19th and early 20th century and that's why we need to have a review and rethink of just how government deals with the realities of the digital economy Oh All right, God, so this yes. brings us perfectly to the question that I was going to ask, except that Michael Fromberger once uh, posed a very similar question. So I'm going to let him ask it. The floor is yours, Michael. Hi, thank you. Uh, and this is, a, this is a fantastic conversation. I'm really happy to be listening to this. And so I really have what I think is hopefully just a simple question. It's not a simple question. Well, <laughs> I, I it's, it is Anybody a simple question. In, oh, this isn't going to yeah. hurt. I'm yeah. just it's a constant no, well, lawyer. Let me be clear. I, I acknowledge that this is actually a very large question. It's a simple question to ask, but not to answer. Okay. It's like so, a mouse trap. Yes. A lot acknowledge trap. that this is a big really question. Really easy so, to get in. Yeah. Get what out. I'm really hoping for here is kind of to, to hear a broad sketch rather than fine details. Acknowledge that it is difficult. You talked at the beginning a little bit about, you know, having to kind of deal with sort of the agency as it was constituted originally. And I guess what I wonder is if you leave aside the political matter, which is real, but of what might actually be possible given a, given a particular administration and the legislature, if you yourself could reconstitute the FCC today, sort of from first principles, based on your experience, what would you say are the most important kind of high level changes that you would like to make from the current rules and, and kind of broadly why do you think that those are the most important? And I realize this is probably a huge topic, but I'm really just kind of interested in the outlines mostly because I this is something that matters a lot to me as a technologist and uh, something that I care a great deal about as someone who cares a great deal about both freedom of speech, but also a kind of a reasonable interaction with my fellow humans. So before well, you answer that question, yeah. I, I, I actually <clears throat> think like a bit of history here is really important because like what people understand the FCC to regulate and not to regulate is really important in conditioning this question. So the FCC is created in the early 1930s it is divided into, is it six bureaus? Yeah, it fluctuates, but the answer is yes. Roughly yeah, so. and so there's a bureau for radio. There is a bureau. No, there's, a, there's a media bureau. There's an international bureau. There's a common carrier bureau. There's a wireless bureau. A uh, cable. Consumer bureau. Um, um, and, and, so, and, and they're always so, so for instance, Radio and television, they used to be separate. They got merged into, into media. Um, there's talk about merging common carrier and wireless. I mean, it's, it's all, it's, 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 it's just moving the boxes around. But there are all <clears throat> kinds of things, for example, Zoom and YouTube right. that are not common carriers. Like if you're watching this on Zoom, uh, you're, the service provider that is giving you internet access may be FCC regulated, depending on which one it is, but the, the Zoom service is not, and ditto YouTube, is that right? Right, right. right. But so, it looks an awful lot like television to me. Right, so like, there's a, and there's a whole lot of examples like that that are, uh, you know, when the, in, when the entity came into existence is, whether it is regulated is highly historically contingent on when the business entity came into existence and what at a technical level, though not at a service provision level, that it does. And so, I, I mean, we could spend five hours describing this history, but I think broadly speaking, that is the important, and Tom, if you think there are other important sort of background points, 
bring them up, but but those to me are the, is the, the the critical background to however you want to answer this question. Could could I add one more thing? Just that you've said a few times, and it kind of leads into this, which is that you said that you think that we need to fundamentally restructure how we think about kind of like communications governance, like in the in like just because we have all of these old laws and everything else. So this is related to that. So people like humans, but particularly judges and the law reason through analogy, like they just have to analogize to something. They analogize to past cases and past facts. Um, I, I feel like, as Ben said, a lot of these things are of the moment that they happen to be created and, and the closest possible analogy that had the most salience at the time. How do you get around that yeah, kind sure. of problem? Sure. Sure. So, so, um, I, well, I mean, so I think there's basically, I, I was thinking about, I would respond in three buckets here and Kate, you just opened the door to the first bucket because policymakers always define, uh, today and tomorrow in terms of what they understand, understood yesterday, you know, um, Madeleine Albright, Albright had a great description of foreign policy that I then shamelessly stole uh, as a description of technology policy in that we, um, we define 21st century technology in 20th century terms and propose 19th century solutions. And, um, and, and that's the reality. I mean, you, you know, I mean, and I, I don't mean, I, I'm not, not casting any aspersions against uh, about any members of Congress or anything like that, but I would go up. I've spent the last 40 years at the intersection of new technology and public policy. And, um, and policymakers make decisions by analogy, as you were just pointing out with, with judges. Oh, this reminds me of and one of the things used to always frustrate me at the commission was that um, I would make a proposal that had very much 21st century overtones. And I would have to go answer questions that were based on 20th century understandings that no longer applied, but were firmly held. Um, and all the and, East India Tea Company, man. Uh, totally, uh, you know, yes. So, so, um, so we go back uh, to um, the fact that, you know, uh, Eric Schmidt wrote a book in 2013, I think, in which he described the internet as, quote, the largest unregulated space in the world. And um, I'm sorry, my wife's phone is ringing across the table here, okay. Um, and, um, and, and he was a champion of the concept of permissionless innovation. You know, I mean, wow, the things that we're doing right now, I mean, oh my God, they're close to magic. And if government touches them, they'll break the magic. And, um, and uh, and that created this environment of the largest unregulated <laughs> structure in there. What is it? 20% of the S&P now is controlled by four or five companies that, that were the beneficiaries of that in the process, crunching a bunch of others on the way. But anyway, so there, first of all, there was that kind of a con job that digital is different. And I go back to the point I made before. It's not how, it's what. It is not what's the delivery. It is, it's not how do you deliver it. It, it. it is not how do you put together these pictures that we're looking at on the screen right now. It is what is the effect of that and how do you need to oversee it? So that's kind of point one, that we are just recovering from a huge and hugely successful sales job. And today I saw in the post that... Um, Mark Zuckerberg is uh, is organizing a new uh, industry association uh, that will come lobby um, uh, the Congress on behalf of these digital giants taking advantage of of COVID to say we're the only way they can get any answers. On it. So that's that was kind of point one. The, the second point to, to to Michael's question 
is that we need to understand that the assets that we're dealing with today are different from the assets that we used to deal with. And as a result, how you, how they behave in the marketplace is different and how you oversee that is, is different. You, you know, industrial assets were exhaustible. So I have a lump of coal, I can burn it, it's gone data assets are inexhaustible. I use them and use them and use them and use them and use them. You know, when you add a new subscriber to Facebook, you're using the same code that the previous subscriber used. And the use is also non-zero sum. If, if you use them, I'm, I'm, I'm mean, getting there. I can't. I'm, exactly. I'm, get, I'm, I'm getting there. That it's, it's not, your point is it's non-rivalrous. That's my, the, the, the second thing is that, is that, is that, in an industrial economy or in an internet economy, a data economy, data creates data, which creates a new product, which creates data, which creates a new product in an inexorable growth machine. You know, it, every time Ford goes to make a new truck, they got to go out and they got to buy the, the steel and the tires and the windscreen and all this sort of stuff. Every time Microsoft sells a new copy of Word, boom, <laughs> well, they just, they send it out. And then when you do that, it creates new data that you turn around then and use again. And then the third point is Ben's point about it's non-rivalrous, so back to this lump of coal. If I have this lump of coal, you can't have this lump of coal. But, um, but in, in a digital world, we can share that. And we all get the same kind of benefits out of it. But the companies have structured themselves in a way in which they capture your information and my information and, and make it their corporate asset and hoard it in a rivalrous kind of concept and deny it to everybody else. So, 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 but so, what, so boil Michael's question down. If you were designing the FCC from scratch today, uh, what does it have the authority to regulate in a world in which if we take as a given your principles that we're dealing with a, uh, yep. uh, an iteratively generative non-rivalrous asset right. in which, uh, by the way, uh, the, um, uh, you know, uh, um, the, the, the world uh, is you know non-industrial. It's non. The, this stuff is non-depletable, and it doesn't matter how you do it. It only matters what you do. What does in your perfect world the FCC have the authority to regulate? So that goes to the my next point, which was structure and how do you have oversight? You cannot have this kind of an economy, this kind of a, 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 a of a, um, a power in the economy without some kind of public participation. Um, and, and so your question, Ben, and Michael's question was, how would you do it at the FCC? And my answer is, you need a new structure. That the solution is not to go bolt things on to the FCC, the FTC, whatever the case may be. That the solution needs to be a new structure um, that deals with the fact that these assets are different and that the behaviors using those assets are different and comes up with a structure that itself is different. So for instance, I, I wrote a book called From Gutenberg to Google, The History of Our Future that just got published last year. One of the- start with goo. Huh? It's, they both start what? with goo. You got it. You know, you're always perceptive that way. You right? know, focusing in on the things you know, that matter. You're just, your ability to boom, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, just, um, you know, people miss the big picture sometimes. <laughs> and, 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 and I talked about network revolutions. And, um, and, and, and the interesting thing here is that the, the, the Industrial Revolution really began with the railroad. And um, the, the railroad was the first large scale operation, both to build and to run. There had never been anything of that size. 
And so they went looking for folks who had experience running big things. Where was that? The army. So the railroad ended up being run by West Pointers and other officers who imported a um, hierarchical command and control kind of structure, which became the structure of the management structure of the industrial age. You know, the guy on the floor, and it was a guy on the factory floor, had a set of rules. He was supervised by somebody to make sure that he was following the rules. And the supervisor had some had a manager above him to make sure that everybody was following the rules. And so when government came along to create structures that would oversee that industrial reality, they just took the management techniques of the time and made them their own. And so we're surprised we have a rules-based bureaucracy. But the reality is that in the digital era, nobody runs their companies that way anymore. And, you know, I mean, the, the, the thing now in a software company is agile software development. I mean, I, I ran a software company back in the 80s and, and, and we used to produce software like a, a Ford assembly line. You do this and this and this and a linear process. And at the end, everything would be done. You'd say, thank you very much. Today, software is never done. The reason you're always getting updates on your smartphone, the reason why your computer uh, the software is, is always updating is it's constantly evolving to the environment that it is in. Therefore, that's called agile management. The challenge becomes how do we have agile regulatory oversight? How do we introduce the concept of management agility into the oversight of agile companies. Well, and that's is, where I would go if I were king and 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 were able to to it's create. A new really, it's a really interesting point. I think that that's exact. So, I mean, I've had this kind of this kind of theory for a while, which is uh, no offense to the organization that you used to work for, but that it is just not the organization that we need in order to kind of fix these problems. And unfortunately, what you should like the most agile thing is the companies themselves, and to try to create some type of build in to this new kind of private, privately owned, but like privately owned space that governs public rights and oversees all of this public, our ability to speak to each other and all of these other, um, all of these other things. And which has none of the affordances that meat space had, that coal has, that, you know, that trains have, um, I mean, it's cheap, it's ubiquitous, it's infinite, like all of our communications and data, all of this stuff is, um, it's so different than anything we've ever dealt with before. Um, but my answer to that is like, we can't rebuild the FCC, we can't scrap years of doctrine. Um, the best you could kind of do is to, like, in my mind, is to kind of try to work with the companies to to create some type of new participatory structure in in this public Bingo. space. We are so close on the, we are so much on the same wavelength, Kate. And I don't like Ohio State. So. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. You just defied, Kate, the fundamental rule of politics. What? And I want to just zero in on this for all audiences, <laughs> present and future. Yeah. If you agree about thing A, but I have and to razz him each other over thing B. Yeah, but talk but you know, about thing A and never bring up thing B again. No. But Ben, that's, it's fun that's, to that's, have. That's, it's fun to have a rivalry over Ohio. That's and... wise. That is wise counsel. But the difficulty is that when you're in a constant, to use the term our president uses, loser position then you take these kind of cheap shots. It's so true. And, Michigan and, sucks. They've like, they've literally hasn't, they have not won it. Like, I mean, and they haven't even been close games. Like every, every game, every like the game has been terrible. Like it has okay. been a blowout. Hey, hey, you were from upstate New York. Oh, my brother went, went to Michigan. I don't even have college, a strong thing. I told Island, you, I just wanted to give him grief. You went to grad school in Washington and New Haven. What do you give a shit about the state of Michigan for? I just, I'm, I'm a very complicated person, Ben. <laughs> and, uh, with, with clearly some very challenged judgments along the way. I mean, look, I, you know, look, my, there was this point in my life 
where, and it happened one day where I just gave up being a sports fan and I have well, never you, looked back. And I've you been, went to Oberlin. No, 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 no. I was a very passionate Yankees fan my whole life until the, uh, the drug scandals and the, um, and then I just left baseball and I never, I've literally never thought about it again. And I turned all of that attention to the sport that I thought uh, was actually doing something serious about doping, which was- Was it the cycling. French horn? No, it was, was... It, was, it was professional cycling. Yo, which, good. Yeah. Oh, good. And oh, then I found out that I was the big, you know, people think that I'm like, a naive idiot because I endorsed Bill Barr's nomination. There's nothing like Lance Armstrong, man. Um, and then when when it when it turned out that all this energy that I'd turned to uh, cycling was, uh, you know, it, I just realized I had been a fool. I I just I just one day said, okay, I'm just never going to follow any competitive sports again. The only sports I'm interested in are ones that I or somebody I care about are physically participating in right now. And the result is this immense amount of time opens up to you. Cause you know, Richard Posner was once asked how he was so productive. And his answer, this glib answer he gave was, well, I don't want waste any time watching sports on television. And I thought it was a glib, stupid answer until I stopped watching sports yeah. on television. And then I realized it was actually the answer to a lot of our problems in the world. And so I say, you're both wasting time, um, you know, do more gardening. So, so my line, people say to me, how do you have time to write these books? And I say, I don't play golf. You know, same kind of, a, of an answer, but I do need to give you one insight. I mean, there, there, there are things that are really important in life. And this happens to be one Ohio of Ohio State? The Ohio State University. Yeah, I'm really um, important. And so I, I, so, and I, and I, I have two young grandsons. And, and last year, I took them back to a game. I take them back to a game every year. And the problem is, will I be allowed to this year? And, and we took them into the locker room. And um, the, there was on the locker room wall, the season schedule, you know, and it went down week by week by week. By the way, Ben and Kate, the last game on the season was the national championship. Excuse me, let's understand what we're here for, right? <laughs> but in the last week in November, it would, it would go down, you know, Penn State, little Penn State logo, the date, and then the last Saturday in November, it had T-U-N and um, no logo, no nothing. That was it on the line. And my grandson says to me, Papa, he says, what's ton? And I said, that's team up north. We don't use the word around here. I like that, actually. That's pretty good. And, and I am so proud that both of my grandsons now have adopted that. And the classic was that, that my daughter says to my grandson, are you gonna watch the Michigan game with Papa? And he gets this look in his eye and he gets this sassy tone and he says, mom, we don't use that word around here. <laughs> See, this is why I do like sports for this. It's like, it's generation. It's a, it's a, it's a, it, it, get, it does bridge generations and it basically, it's just like a fun way to tease people. And I don't know. It's just like a, always a thing to talk about that's fairly neutral. I don't know. I don't take, I have no problem. I <laughs> don't actually dislike them, the, the, uh, the Ohio State University that much. So as to take a chip on my shoulder about it, I just think that it was, when you have revealed your allegiance, I had to kind of Okay. All right. Well, well, those of us who are from Oberlin College, we don't dislike the Ohio State University either. We just don't notice it. Uh, Kevin Erickson, the floor is yours. Hi. Um, uh, question uh, for the chairman. Uh, first, thank you for your leadership. We miss you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Kevin. Um, it, was a great up... it was a great time and a great job. And I loved it, Kevin. Thank you. Um, well, well, you brought up edge providers and, you know, 
um, in the context of, of the things that the, the commission is dealing with now, it sort of brings up this issue of regulatory parity. Um, right. When you look at the broad marketplace, the FCC still has jurisdiction over the companies that the, the, the big traditional broadcasters, AM, FM radio. Right. Um, and they complain constantly about the fact that digital gets to go unregulated. The edge providers, the tech giants, the digital platforms are relatively unregulated. And that gives them this unfair advantage, whereas radio is just burdened by, by regulation. And so they think that the solution is to just aggressively deregulate, throw out every right. public interest protection that exists. Right. They've got right. a proposal out right now that would remove the ownership caps and that would allow like a single company to own every commercial radio station yep. in most local markets. Right. And that's popular among the current leadership, but I'm wondering if, if you agree with it, that it just makes more sense to sensibly regulate both. Like uh, instead of relaxing the public interest protections that are applied to FM radio, figure out a sensible regu regulatory regime to address Google, to address Facebook. You know, I don't want to live in a world that's controlled by iHeartRadio or Sinclair any more than I want to live in a world that's controlled by Google or Facebook. Yep, I think I think you're absolutely right, Kevin. And the, um, Ben, you're on mute. Ben, you're on mute. I just want to say I'm fine with any outcome as long as it doesn't regulate Zoom broadcasts well you know um no i mean i mean kevin raises a really good point and and um the the number one complaint you hear when you're chairman of the fcc is it's not fair i mean it's like kids on a playground you know I have to live under this, but I've also got to compete with these folks and they don't have to live under that. And that's not fair. And the answer is, you know, I'm sorry. This is kind of like the old thing about, you know, you know Johnny's mom lets him do it. You know, and my mother used to always say, I'm not Johnny's mom. And, um, and, and uh, the rules that you have to, exist under that were established by the people's representatives say thus and so. They, they don't say so long as it's fair. Now, of course, there has to be a, a an equilibrium that you that you seek. I mean, I, I, I started out in the in the telecom business in the cable industry. And uh, in 1976, when cable was community antenna television, and, um, and the broadcasters had succeeded in convincing the FCC that it wasn't fair that cable was carrying their signals into distant markets, um, and that therefore the FCC had to regulate and limit the activities of cable operators. The word cable is never mentioned in the statute, obviously. The FCC had never regulated cable before. And they came up with this concept that, well, it's ancillary to broadcasting. So we need to go in and put restrictions on cable because we are responsible for broadcasting and unfair things can't be done to broadcasting. That's a hell of a way to run a railroad. So. I'm going to say really, so speaking of kind of the run a railroad, you're familiar with, do you know about the um, Larry Lessig, uh, Eric Posner, or not Eric Posner, um, was it, was, Richard oh no, Post it was Easterbrook. It was the Easterbrook, the law of the horse debate. Have you ever heard no. about this? No. So this was like in the early nineties and Judge Easterbrook um, of the seventh circuit was just kind of, was at a, at a talk about the new cyber law. And uh, was basically gave this keynote speech that was like, there is no such thing as cyber law, just like there's no such thing as horse law. Um, we don't have law, we don't have car law because someone invented cars. Like we just folded into torts 
and property and all of these other things, right? And like we use the same forms and they answer the same question. And Larry Lessig was a professor at Harvard, um, was uh, basically responded in this, I think it was, I think it was a uh, Harvard Law Review comment said like, no, the, like the law of like um, an answer to the law of the horse, the law of cyberspace, it makes this very compelling argument about all of the ways the affordances that you kind of described change, change things so fundamentally that we need a new type of law to deal with it. Now I teach internet law, but I'm just kind of curious if that's something uh, that you, but one of the interesting things about teaching internet law now in like 2020 is that every single law school class now is uh, has some aspect of the internet in it. Like it yeah. has some sure. case that has come up in the internet, sure. like some recent case in which they've had to, con whether it's click wrap on software, you know, or like the sex.com case in like, you know, the ninth circuit about whether or not a domain name was property or like, you know, all of these types of, right. all of these types of things. And so I'm just kind of curious, I've been kind of noodling on this idea for a while of having a conference or doing something that like just reignites this debate some like 25 years later of like, well, even though I really wanted Larry Lessig to be right and generally think that he is about a lot of things, uh, maybe maybe the the internet is becoming all, maybe everything in law is becoming internet law. And so there doesn't need to be a separate thing anymore. I even go further than that, okay? I suggest we go back a few centuries and that English common law has basic concepts that we need to be figuring out how to put in place today. Principally, the duty of care and the duty to deal. You know, duty to care, you know, you have a responsibility to anticipate and mitigate adverse impacts. Excuse me, does Facebook do anything like that? No. What okay. do you think protects it from that? Section 230? Mm, uh, no. Um, uh, we can get on to 230. I think 230 is 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 granular it's a piece of the of the puzzle um but um but how do we develop law that says you've got responsibilities you know i again in this in from gutenberg to google i i, I told the story about how how this was applied to railroads in the mid 19th century that that a steam locomotive would go ripping across a farmer's field which they had taken by eminent domain. Okay. Are you going to use the? Are you going to use the coast? Or sorry. No. Are you, oh, sorry. No. And it was and it was throwing off sparks like mad. Okay. That would set fire to hayricks and barns and this sort of thing. And um and um and it was the root of negligence, right? And um and so the railroads put a screen across the top of the smokestack to catch the hot cinders. Okay. Hey. So um, what's the screen that we put on this really great new development? Um, similarly, the duty to deal, um, you know, goes back to what, 13th century and the end of the dark ages and, and, um, and the responsibility of, uh, of a ferryman to be able to, to, to ferry everybody to the other side of the river, regardless of who they were, they had to pay. But, um, but you had to provide uh, non-discriminatory access, you know, because they were an essential service. Excuse me, the internet's an essential service today. I was just gonna say, do you think the pandemic proves that more than ever? You bet. All right, I wanna talk about 5G before we run out of time. I have a simple question. Are we completely fucked? <laughs> um, in, in terms of what, Ben? Well, in terms of, um, and I don't wanna be too political about this, but in terms of China having a very clear national strategy and, uh, and an engine through which to uh, employ that strategy in right. Huawei, um, a, um, and we have uh, no obvious counter strategy uh, other than saying no Huawei. Uh, and we have no vehicle through which to uh, 
operationalize the non-strategy that we have. And so my question is, um, you know, every, everybody seems to engage the 5G Huawei question at the level of should we Huawei or not, right? And should we, how should we respond to countries that don't refuse to Huawei? But my question is the sort of tectonic one below that. Um, uh, how do you compete for dominance of the domain or, or even a competitive space within the domain yeah. if you're not prepared to have a, have a battle plan and you don't have a mechanism through which to compete? And what's the alternative to the policy that we're in or the sort of non-policy flailing that we're engaged in? Well, it was a sad day when 5G and Huawei got conflated. They are important issues. They are interrelated. I am a strong believer in the fact that I don't want Huawei in American networks. But um, the you, you got to go back and let's, let's start with what is 5G. 5G is a tool. It is not a product. Yet it's always talked about in terms of, oh, it's some kind of product. You know, we didn't win one G. We're rolling two. out 5G. Hey, yeah, that's right. But, but, but we, were, we weren't first in 1G, 2G, 3G, or 4G. Yet American technology and applications dominate the wireless world. So first to the tape is important, but not essential. You raised the question about competing with China. How do you compete with a command economy? Um, you don't compete by having your own command economy, okay? Because one of the realities about a command economy is that it is inherently um, inflexible, and um, and has an impact on innovation, and so I don't. Th and so a command economy does a great job um, um, implementing things, but a crappy job innovating. And I think that what we need to be doing is saying, okay, how are we going to be the innovative leaders, which is what we did in four G. And um, and and that. In order for that to happen, you have to have a thousand flowers bloom, which brings us back to our policy discussions, which is how do you get out of an environment where the internet is controlled by a handful of major network companies and a handful of major service provider companies that control the asset of the 21st century, i.e. data? And how do you stimulate innovation? And that's the 5G challenge um, uh, I think I, you know, one of the points I make in from Gutenberg to Google, I can't believe I'm plugging the book that much. Um, I just bought but, it on Amazon. God bless you. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, one of the points I make is that it is never the primary network that is transformational, but the secondary impact of that network. That's where we want to play the game. How do we want to be the most innovative people in the world? I was, I was in, 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 at Cambridge University a few months ago discussing this at a session there. And I'm walking through Cambridge one night with a guy who lives in China and a tech, a tech guy in China. And we're talking about this. And he mutters something in Chinese. And I, of course, look at him with no idea what he just said. And he translates it for me. And it is... The more you try, the more you fail. And it is apparently a slogan in China software development circles because you're told this is what we want you to develop. And if you go outside those lines, you fail. You know, that's exactly the opposite of, of, of what Thomas Edison's, um, uh, I didn't fail. I, did, I didn't fail 10,000 times. I just found 10,000. I successfully found 10,000 things that didn't work. And, and it is, it, it is, it is 
let's the command economy has got its own advantages. A capitalistic free market economy has its own advantages if we will let those advantages roar. And the key to that is to go back to your point, Ben, about non rivalrous assets and have open access to the data that is the asset of the 21st century so that everybody can go out there and build their own innovation. That's how you win 5G. On that optimistic note, uh, uh, we are going to wrap up. Um, um, Tom, thanks for joining us. This was fun. Thanks, Ben. Sorry, it was in lieu of fun, but it was fun. Yeah, I really, this is great. I'm like, I'm a few miles from, um, I actually was planning a surprise on May 24th. I was going to go and visit and take uh, to the Marconi station, uh, which I'm a few, which I'm a few, I'm like a few miles from uh, where uh, Moore sent his first telegram that said, what hath God wrought? Uh, and I feel like that is a good way to like, well, as we talk about Morse code. He, uh, sent, he sent that from Washington. Oh, you're right. He did send it from Washington. That from That went from yes. Washington to Baltimore. That and one, yes. Thing, what was the, the one, past- what did he send across the Atlantic? That was, it wasn't him. That was Marconi that went across the, uh, the Atlantic. Okay. The, uh, so the- it was the first Morse code that, that was, that was the what hath God wrought. And it was just from, so was the Atlantic, the Atlantic must have happened later. The Atlantic Cable happened late. Well, no, no. So, so Marconi was what Mar- all Marconi did was really boost the power. You know, the, the the theory was that because the Earth is round, you send a signal out; it's straight. It'll do you have, shoot do you off. have sourcing on that? Can you back that up at all? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel sure. like- I did my my PhD in far- particle physics. Um, <laughs> But anyway, we, we can go to that in the next session if Ben will ever invite me back. Dude. Oh my God, you should definitely come back. I have like a bajillion other, like I'm like fangirling like crazy over here. I have, this is so nice. You this should, is- uh, you should definitely come back. So before we went live, Tom, I, I pointed out to Tom that we have now done this 49 days in a row. And Tom was excited to know that he had made the top 50. <laughs> so to uh, our, our guest tomorrow is gonna be Ken White of, of, uh, of Pope Hat fame. And so everybody who has not been on the show before Ken White cannot <laughs> say they've made the top 50, but uh, Tom, you can, and uh, you're welcome back anytime with Lafroig or without. Um, I, uh- and, you know, uh, I, think, I think you got to make top 50 t-shirts, mugs, whiskey glasses. We you need know, merch, mean, Ben. Yeah, I mean, Ben, I mean, let's understand here. I'm, get the, I'm game. Get the, let's got do to have it. Got to the swag. Got to have the All swag. All right, let's do it. So, Kate, do you have a sign-off for us today? I do. I have a Simpsons clip um, that this is, uh, this is perfect. Hold on. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, apparently, the Simpsons per, um, predicted not only um, the pandemic, but murder hornets and the pandemic together <laughs> in 1993. Whoa. Uh, so now we're going to watch this clip. We need a cure! <laughs> Why, the only cure is bed rest. Anything I give you would only be a placebo. Where do we get these placebos? Maybe there's some in this truck. <laughs> The dreaded Osaka flu has hit Springfield with over 300 cases now reported. Anyways, it is a little bit tenuous, but I think that you could basically say that Matt Groening should get like a Nobel Peace Prize. (laughs) It's not that tenuous. They've actually got killer communal insects and a deadly pandemic in the same episode. And a flu pandemic. Like it's like that specific. They didn't even go with Ebola. I mean, look, everything sucks and, uh, you know, you're not allowed to have fun anymore, but we'll be back tomorrow at five o'clock. And so what do we say, Kate? In lieu of fun, come have fun with us.
Yeah, pretty good. Okay. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, Bye. Tom. Bye, Bye Tom. Guys. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah.